money and to start. Um, my name is Hugo Bean, I'm a certain professor of the law school, teaching my PhD here, and today I'm very happy to have uh, uh, Professor He Tianxia from the Hong Kong City Law School to give a lecture on a very interesting topic, the transplant of the uh, fair use doctrine to China, talk about the uh, history, elements, and uh, future. I think that this topic is very interesting to me. Uh, of course, uh, I personally participated in the legislative process uh, in China for the first amendment of uh, Chinese copyright law. During this kind of process, and a lot of uh, discussion on whether China should adopt a uh, general fair use article and, uh, like that in the United States. And I think that's a lot of people participated in this discussion. And now we split over. Uh, over this issue. So personally, I'm very interested uh, to you know what's the Dr. Uh, Professor Tianxiang's comments. Uh, before he start his lecture, I will explain a little bit about the background of this event. This event was sponsored by the EU Commission. We have a joint project on the EU-China people and uh, judicial cooperation. And this project is led by a Kumari University which make you know, us uh, to do all kinds of exchange activities among the member universities. We work on some kind of key uh, issues uh, interesting both China and the EU. And also we regulate, regulate the professors from the member university to do lecture like this today. Uh, <coughs> here I give a very brief introduction to Professor Ke Tianxia, Dr. Hu, who uh, is a LLB degree. <coughs> from Hwa University in 2007, a master's degree in international law from Zina University. He also received his degree of PhD in IP law from a very famous university in Maastricht, the University of the Netherlands, where he, he was a researcher at the Department of International and European Law, and he a PhD fellow at the Institution for Globalization of International Regulation. And another, he also got another PhD from Remy University, major is criminal law. And now he's a full time professor of the Hong Kong City University Law School. But he's also <coughs> an author of a book, Copy and uh, Ban Productivity in China. And his article appealed in a lot of SSCI journals, such as American Journal of Comparative Law. Primary Journal of in Intellectual Property, Journal of the Copyright Society of the USA, and Computer Law and Security Reviews. I think that probably, the, as I know, Professor Hu uh, is the published, uh, I guess, the uh, most of the SSI articles in IP among young Chinese scholars. So I'm um, very happy to have uh, Professor here to share his uh, findings on the very interesting topic of fair use. Okay, please join me. Welcome. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Uh, very sorry that I have to come up this sort of like presentation in English. Uh, but of course, we can discuss more in Chinese. And I think my uh, presentation will be very clear and very simple for you to understand. So, uh, unlike Professor Sui here, <coughs> who actually got participate in the amendment process for many times. I'm only sort of like an outsider, so I observe most of my uh, findings uh, uh, from the literatures that I find, that I can find, right? So the, the, the reason why I'm doing this is because uh, I read two articles written by Peter Liu last year. So this is very interesting research done by Peter Liu because he is trying to find why uh, the, the US fair use model was uh, transplanted in some places, uh, verbatim, and whereas in some jurisdictions, they didn't, they, they refused to transplant uh, the fields, or they just only taken part of the structure of the fields. So what I'm trying to do is to do like a global paradigm evolution observation to see why this happens in terms of, uh, from a comparative law perspective. So he said, yeah, despite the eagerness of many jurisdictions to introduce the theories model, which includes China, so these jurisdictions make a consensus choice 
So to retain a considerable part of the status quo, by which it means that your own like the structure of the fair use uh, or copyright exceptions, either by incorporating pre-existing copyright limitations and exceptions into the new fair use regime, or by transforming the regime with an adaptive list of illustrative purposes. So he find out that part of the reason why many policy makers and legislators embrace a hybrid model uh, uh, as opposed to the US model is that they want to better adapt to the transplant to local conditions. So by which he means that uh, many of these uh, countries or jurisdictions that are trying to transplant the fair use doctrine uh, they uh, consensuously make some decisions based on their local conditions, and so therefore they adapt the fair use and make some of the uh, some of these useful parts into uh, their own law, uh, whereas they keep some of these uh, bad or they think unuseful parts away. Right. So um, we all know that uh, William Alfred mentioned in his book in 1995 <coughs> that China actually accepted the concept of copyright at common law. By which he means that uh, before uh, the, the new, uh, what we say, the 1990 uh, copyright law of China, which is the fourth, sort of the first enforceable modern copyright law in the history of China, and also uh, including its subsequent revisions in 2001 and 2010, they are not something that born within China. By which he means that they are forced upon by like a, like a. Like uh, the, the, the external pressure is primarily relating to Sino-US trade negotiations and disputes. So, by which you mean that we don't actually, uh, when we have the copyright law, we don't actually know what copyright is. Uh, but when we have this, uh, we need to find find out a way to sort of structure our laws and, and to, to build like a very uh, uh, solid quote. Um, what I observe is that in general, actually four factors have together shaped the copyright law of China design. The first is that we have a, a sort of like a civil law tra tradition of the Chinese legal system. Right? So because that is kind of the structure that limits how we design our law. And the second is that the norms and standards set by international copyright treaties. So by which it means that if you have a Berlin Convention that sets sort of like a minimum standard of protection, uh, and it actually provides some sort of a structure uh, on how to, uh, for, you know, to form your own law, and it actually limits how you could design your law. And the third is that countries and uh, regions that with influential and robust IP systems, such as the US and the EU. So if like uh, strong countries like the United States, when they give pressures to China, they possibly sometimes will uh, convey uh, some of their own ideas about copyright and how you should form your copyright law. And the fourth is that we, we do have our local needs, uh, and such as the challenges raised by new technologies. And this together is, shape, will, will, uh, is uh, what's, shape, what's shaping the copyright law and will be continue shaping our copyright law in the future. So uh, we all know that we, we, we are now having an ongoing third like a uh, revision of the cover of China. Uh, but uh, possibly what I heard is that it will come out next year. Uh, but then, uh, then I think it's, uh, there's a sort of like a urgent need to critically assess the copyright law development process and the purpose, because, uh, and the purpose changes accordingly. Um, um, among these all the issues identified in the copyright law of China, I think the future model of China's copyright exceptions will be the most uh, contentious and it's, as it involves the protection of copyright owners' interests and directly concerns public interests, such as access to knowledge and freedom of expression. So uh, my study actually aims to ascertain what actually is the factors uh, determining <coughs> whether a transplant occurs and controls the relation between the transplanted rules and society in which they subsequently operate. Uh, thereby identifying possible uh, future trends and determining an ideal model of corporate exceptions that can accommodate different needs uh, of the government, corporate owners, and public in China. So the structure will be uh, pretty simple. Uh, the first part, I will sort of discuss the historical constraints placed on the current model of corporate exceptions. And the second part, uh, and also uh, I'll talk about the corporate law and the new challenges that the corporate law is facing. And the second part is actually the practice or attitude of the Chinese courts when they uh, when they're facing problems, how they uh, how they actually uh, utilizing the law to do 
utilize the law to, to solve problems. And the third part is, uh, uh, I will briefly discuss the proposal and, and of the Third Amendment and, and, this, uh, and sort of try to, to, to explain why we cannot introduce fair use, or, 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 or yes or no, right? So then the fourth part would be a possible model of corporate section in China, that uh, some, something that I will uh, 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 propose a little bit. So why we have a closed list model in the first beginning? Um, I think, unsurprisingly, uh, as I said, uh, uh, we don't have copyright, you know, any idea of copyright in the beginning. So when we have our new law and, and we we sort of have a problem to get rid of the, the old uh, like, down, you know, inference. So uh, we need to develop something on our own. So therefore, even though we have some previous laws that was unavoidable in, 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 in China, but then we need to sort of be our own law at the beginning. So the source could be identified by uh, many scholars is that maybe we, 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 we sort of bought the whole structure from the Berlin Convention. And some point to the mixture of several international treaties and various laws enacted by the developed nations. So what uh, I observe is that they send people to outside and to try to learn from the, the well developed countries and to see how their role goes. And they will come back and sort of uh, introduce it to uh, our own country. So, a kind of uh, advantage is to, to borrow from international treaties is that if you borrow from international treaties, then you will be much acceptable to the Chinese public at a time when we just open up our country. Because if you borrow the structure from the United States, then it will be a big problem. And as you may know, that if you borrow from the old China, then it's still a problem. So better if you just follow the international treaty uh, and, and to do your own law, then it's much more acceptable at a time. And the second is that if you copy directly from international treaties, and it actually provides a way for China to show that it has fulfilled its treaty obligations. This has also been pointed out by Wang Qian in 2012. So by which it means that um, most of the time, if you sort of like uh, build a new law, then sometimes you have to uh, explain why it fits the international standard, right? But then if you just copy it from it, and the structure is more or less like it, then it will be okay to explain to them this is something that follows the international treaty uh, and, and obligations. We also have some drawbacks that I observe is that the cost of international treaties are not designed for direct application because if you borrow terms from uh, uh, like uh, uh, international treaties because uh, the treaties are often the result of uh, diplomatic com uh, compromises and the vague wording of the process is is then is an essential part of such an arrangement, by which it means that the wordings are vague enough so that each you know contracting parties or countries will be able to accept. But at the same time, if they accept some of this vague wording that is cover or satisfy both of their needs, then the problem is the vague wording of a certain clause is not suitable for direct application into a law. It has to be uh, adopted or like. Uh, Harmonized or, or you know, transplanted or, or you know, in a way so that they can make use of it. And the second drawback I've observed is that international treaties are not backed by judicial precedents and interpretations, by which it means that they're aiming for uh, like uh, implementation into like the signed parties, signatures. But uh, it, it depends on how you implement these clauses. But they, but as an international treaty, it does not back by jurisprudence. So there's no way, or there's no cases, or there's no interpretations to explain how you make use of this law because it's so vague. You know, and somehow that is kind of uh, impossible for them to do that. So this is also explained, you know, exemplified by the corporate sector model of the corporate of China, because. As we know that the copyright law primarily follows the concept of the European office rights, right? Because we have this uh, model setting. So uh, then, this will uh, adjust the structure of China's copyright exception models to be a closed list rather than an open-ended style. Um, 
has Peter Fong uh, observed that? Uh, Peter Fong is a professor in, in, in Tsinghua as well. So external pressures in China on desire to grow this market already economy are believed to have forced China to adopt a closed leaf model and inhabit the socialist approach toward designing its corporate exceptions. So by which means that when we are trying to open up, we need to show that at least we are sort of, uh, in some way, we are uh, um, 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 not a socialist uh, copyright. We are not enacting a socialist copyright law, by which means that we need to make free use of everything, <coughs> so that kind of like that. We must be sort of conservative in a way to prove that we are a market economy. So that's what, what these explanation is. Um, and Lewinsky also said that a civil tradition requires a rule or an aesthetic interpretation of laws in which the role of judges is then deemed that of interpreters rather than the rule makers. So you have a law, you have the judges to interpret the law. So this is certainly at odds with the concept of fair use, by which it means that you need the judges to develop the law. So that is kind of in contradiction. So in general, uh, civil law jurisdictions are, are were much more conservative uh, than common law jurisdictions in adopting an open-ended model that were more inclined to stick to post lease exceptions design. Um, so let, let's check what our law looks like, right? So everybody knows copyright law. So the copyright exception model, what we have is Article 22. Um, this article uh, concerns, uh, it actually provides a list and um, of 12 exceptions, everybody knows that. But that this 12 exception was provided by the 1990 copyright of China. So at the beginning, we already have these 12 exceptions and remain largely unchanged following its 2001 and 2010 amendments. So by which means that this kind of setting is like a pre-digital age setting. Um, so by meaning pre-digital age, I think it is quite useful in the pre-digital age and as the fair use of, of doctrine as well, but now it's a bit obsolated because then it's inflexible to a degree to accommodate new challenges. Um, so this will result in applications of the law in corporate sections uh, in, inconsistent and problematic by the Chinese courts uh, because the corporate law of China remains an incoherent patchwork. Um, this is especially true when new challenges arise. So, um, Article 22 provided uh, 12 uh, list exceptions, and Article 21 of the 2013 regulations for the implementation of the Copyright of China uh, then actually provides a two step test to cover these 12 exceptions. So, by which means that if you have uh, like uh, one use that falls down into one of the 12 exceptions, then the Article 21 of the implementation regulation would then act as a, a, a supplementary uh, assessment to see whether something actually fits in that kind of exception. But the problem is that um, um, the problem is that the definitions of the terms used in the Article 21, like normal exploitation and legitimate interest, are not provided by the law and are left to the courts to determine because that was definitely something implemented from the very three-step test. As I said, uh, you, you have some explanatory notes about the, the, the international treaty, but that doesn't provide you guidance on how to, to use it in your you know, own jurisdiction. So this equally applies to the, some of these uh, uh, you know, exotic terms used in specific exceptions. Um, uh, with a lack of uh, judicial precedence, um, then Chinese courts would have no choice to turn to foreign jurisprudence for reference uh, when applying the exceptions because they don't know how to how to explain that kind of thing. So after um, um, entering the uh, digital era, the once stable and useful closed place was constantly challenged by new ways of utilizing words facilitated by the new technologies, uh, leading academics to question whether maintaining a closely list model uh, of proper exceptions was reasonable. So, so this uh, it will be the first issue I identify is that what it means by quotation. Because subsection two of article 22 uh, regarding quotation has been constantly challenged in the courts. 
uh, it reads like this. So a copyright quotation uh, from another person's published work in one's own work for the purpose of introducing or commenting on a certain work or explaining a certain point. But this vague terms used by this course often offers no clear guidance on how to solve real life cases. Because in, for example, in this 2013 case, Bill Borkway versus Bob uh, Stefan, uh, then the court summarized elements that need to be considered in assessing whether a specific use is appropriate. So, that, so although the court has invoked Article 21 of the RCL, uh, but, the man, uh, but the mentioned elements are similar to the U.S. four factors, fair use test. So he says that like this, right? Um, uh, however, in the second instance of, the, of this case, the court applied Article 21 of the, of the RSEL when assessing the use and interpreted terms normal exploitation uh, and illegitimate interest in a systematic manner. So by which means that the first, uh, the first instance actually applied then he used the U.S. concept to fill in what it means by this uh, appropriate or, or the, but then the second the second instance suddenly find out that it's inappropriate to do that, so he's trying to push it to pull it back to the normal way of importation about using this uh, two-step test. At least you, do, you you need to cover your, your interpretation into these two steps. So this will be sort of like a normal case, but then. Uh, the challenge is more evident in some new types of uh, use, uses of copyright works. The first type would be uh, what I described as decontextualized de 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 images and literatures. For example, in this uh, new the poster case, which is ruled in 2014, Shanghai Meishu versus Hua Yishong Di. So uh, the defendant actually designed a promotional poster which decorated with the small cartoon figures that were uh, deemed to reflect the childhood memories of those who were born in the 1980s. So I didn't post that poster in here, but it's very uh, famous if you search and you have it. However, two figures are still under copyright protection. So inside this poster, there are two figures, like the uh, Hima Dong Zhang or Guru Wa, right? So the plaintiff therefore sued the defendant for copyright infringement. So he said, he couldn't use my uh, you know, uh, copyrighted images like the Himal Jindang or Guru as an artistic work or something. You couldn't post it on the poster because that is copyright infringement. You don't have permission. Right? So court, the court then was held that the f defendant used the two common figures to explain the theme of the movie, which was the story about people who were born in the 1980s because the role of the cartoon figures was subsidiary in the poster. The court then held that the quotation was appropriate. So it says that because the, the images were small in terms of the whole post, so it's kind of subsidiary. It's not the main figure of the poster. But the problem is that the full pictorial works are actually used in here. Right? So you, you didn't explain why this is appropriate, because in previous uh, cases, when we decide what is appropriate, we are de describing or we are discussing something about literature works. Like you quote one page instead of the whole book, that is appropriate. But it doesn't, mean, doesn't say that in the previous case. When you call the whole book like this, like a, I mean, call the whole image in here, even if it's a very small size, and why it's just the body. So in the second instance, the, the Shanghai Intellectual Property Court further indicated that assessment of a property should be carried out according to the two-step test. Um, because the quoted copyright figures were comparatively small in size and were not added as a substitution for the original in the market, and as the poster only served a limited purpose, the court held that we would not violate a two-step test of Article 21. So in here, you can see that um, the court is trying to drag the discussion back to the, the current systematic interpretation of how it works in here. It's Article 22 of the list, then you've got Article 21 as a two-step test. So if you have a quotation in here, then you can, of course, uh, bring it back to the Article 21 to see whether if this two-step test. So it shows that even though the, the whole work is utilized in here, which is the picture of the cartoon character, uh, a finding of a proper quotation uh, would not be barred if the use of the different methods. <coughs> so this is something very new already. But then uh, the poster case is, uh, is still a manageable challenge for the courts as they still fall within the definition of a listed exception. So the quotation, right? 
However, in some internet-related hotline cases, providing a clear answer is not very easy. For example, in this Wen Xiaoyang versus uh, Alibaba um, or, or, or Yahoo, which is what we call the thumbnail case, uh, Yahoo actually displayed a thumbnail derived from the plaintiff's work on, on its official site. So we all know that what thumbnail is, right? So uh, if you provide a specific search order, then you will have uh, the, the, the shaped uh, 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 like image. From a doctrinal perspective, Yahoo's app providing a thumbnail is not a quotation, right? And it's certainly not for the purpose of uh, introducing or commanding on a certain work or explaining a certain point, because what it have is to provide a service. If you search, I will provide you an image. So which is something that uh, not covered by the list. So, so the court in the first instance held that because the thumbnail was created for facilitating internet searches rather than copying or editing, editing the picture itself, so uh, Yahoo's act in providing the thumbnail was not infringement. So this analyze actually echoes with the, the US Perfect 10 case. However, the Perfect 10 case uh, was ruled according to US law factors. Uh, where is uh, the fair use? Where is the court in the first instance of thumbnail case failed to explain why serving a different purpose, especially when it's not a listed exception in Article 22 of the Copyright of China, can guarantee an exception. Because what I, what I observe is that in the doctrinal way of, of thinking, that if you have a list and you don't provide any flexibility, what you have to do is that you, you, you have to fit all the things into these 12 exceptions. If you cannot fit, then there's no exception, right? But the courts held, uh, because it serves a different purpose, therefore it can be uh, uh, allowed. So uh, the Beijing Second Intermediate People's Court uh, he saw the, they sort of notice and replaced with a more problemat problematic argument. He claimed that the making of a thumbnail is not an ad of copy, as thumbnails are only provided for a specific purpose of picture searching, and hence are only a way to present search results. This ruling is clearly influenced by the US case, Gordon Roy Parker with Google as well. So by which he means that when you have a new problem, you don't know how to explain it, and sometimes the courts will just search for like similar cases in, in the United States to see how they rule the cases and trying to bring all these discussions back to the Chinese context. So <clears throat> the judgments of the thumbnail case appear to have reaffirmed that the courts have give, given a green light to use instead to utilize the whole word because thumbnail is the same thing as well as the poster case. You make use of a full picture. Uh, however, according to the judgment of the 2010 case, which is the, the Music Copyright Society of China versus Baidu, um, which con concerns the, 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 the caches of copyright lyrics of, mus of musical works. But, uh, so uh, the court ruled that because the caches substitutes the original work, in this case, which is the lyrics. When you search, they display all the lyrics, right? Uh, and thus prejudicing the explained interests of the copyright owner. It is copyright infringement, and thus it is not a search engine service that can be covered by fair use. So uh, what is of crucial importance is therefore uh, uh, not whether a work as a whole or a substantial part of it is utilized by the printer, but whether that use amounts to a substitution in the market, according to the, the, the ruling. A 2013 case, Tong Hong Kui versus Sogo, uh, um, also concerning the caches of website pages provided by a Google search engine that contained copyright literary works, we affirmed that ruling. The court has devoted considerable length of its previous finding to market substitution analysis by claiming that web caches provided by Soho uh, do not substitute for the original uh, web pages that contain copyright works, and the web caches are beneficial to the public as they, have, they can provide an a irreplaceable and substantial value. Interestingly, the court also re reckoned that the web caches cannot be covered by any of the listed exceptions on Article 22 of the Copyright Law of China, but it nevertheless points out that a rigid application of the law will severely jeopardize the public interest. So actually the court uh, is trying to jump out of the list because it cannot explain 
why this can be allowed or deemed as an exception. Therefore, you then just uh, invent something and say, well, this is a public interest. Therefore, for the public interest, even though the law does not provide it, that it's okay for us to say. So as a solution, the court opined that it's permissible for it to go beyond the trial exceptions listed under Article 2 of the Copyright of China, as long as the act concerned can satisfy the substantive requirements of fair use provided by Article 21 of the ICL and is deemed beneficial to the society. So the court's approaches taken by the courts in, in these cases are understandable as making thumbnails and catches of words is clearly not a listed uh, exception uh, provided by Article 22. Uh, hence, if the court ruled against service providers based on the existing law, you would be counterintuitive uh, uh, as against uh, the national policy that aims to promote internet related industry in China because that will actually ban the whole industry of uh, internet searches. Then, uh, not, not only Google, the so called and Baidu will not be working anymore. So, the court's applications, uh, in, uh, for example, the fair use test for the United States. And this practice has caused inconsistencies amongst courts in China. So, what what the uh, the solution provided by actually is provided by the SBC, the Supreme People's Court. So they uh, promulgated a, a judicial interpretation on online copyright disputes in 2012, that uh, which actually sets a new exception and says that. Uh, if they, they are providing these uh, caches and, and thumbnails, then it should be okay for the courts to support it. Um, so, um, so the SBC attempt to end the chaotic uh, application of foreign legal concepts by courts, as demonstrated by the thumbnail case and the caches case, by providing a two-step test that mirrors the Article 21 of the ICL within its judicial interpretation. However, whether this uh, practices is uh, acceptable, I will discuss that in later. Uh, what we have is something is about UGC. Uh, it's also very problematic. For example, like uh, at least three types of UGCs in here. For example, for fan creations, uh, this may include fanfics, fanfics, digital parodies, and doujinshi, uh, fan subs, and scandations. In general, it's a problem of similarity when determining infringement, right? So you still find two works that are similar, then you see whether there are uh, substantial similarity, whether there are prior assets to do that. Uh, the more fabrics depart from the original, uh, the less likely it is to be found a derivative. But if you want to make clear that you are a spin-off or you are a loyal follower of the original work, it is uh, then it will most likely to be infringing and, and generally, there will be no defenses available uh, 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 except maybe for parody. Uh, in China, whether parody will be exempt is another question because we have this uh, mantle case, uh, but there's, there's no actually, actually any case, rulings or judgments on that. So we don't know how the courts will, will, will find that, whether it's a quotation or it's a copyright, there's no uh, definition on that or, or the definite uh, rulings on that. So the problem is. Even though the law has made a very clear choice, for at least at this current stage, that they are infringing, but the problem is that fan creations will not uh, will not stop because it's everywhere, and seemingly uh, people are not going to uh, 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 give too much considerations about the law. So that's why you can download most of everything online and all with the name of fan creations. Uh, also, in this, like uh, Jin Yong uh, versus Jana case, you can see that it's actually a fan work. So it actually follows on Jin Yong's uh, some of these ideas. But uh, when it departs so substantially from Jin Yong's work, then the court actually supports that it's not an infringement because they only use the, the names <coughs> of, of the characters. It's not an infringement of copyright. Another is that what we call the names, right? Of names, they are involved. So in this, uh, you are all users of names, right? So uh, this is something not covered by the child exceptions as well, because uh, we are now more inclined to use names to express ourselves when we uh, speak to each other, right? Some of the names are copyright licensed by, if you use WeChat, then you have some of these copyright licensed names. But some of these names are not like this, right? So I don't think Zhou will give license about this, but uh, anyway, people think that it's funny. 
So they make maps on that. So it actually contains snapshots of clips in the form of motion pictures. So it, it, it captions one scene of the motion picture, uh, usually, or, or some GIF, like uh, lasting for a few seconds, as well as uh, reflect the creative interpretations of the former through the addiction of words by mixing the positive part with extra elements. For example, like Jiwei is more that. Or something like, uh, so Christmas, right? So uh, an old man with a red hat uh, with a uh, white beard. So it actually turned out to be something about uh, uh, Stephen Child's movie. So uh, so these are, are, are some of these uh, things created by the, by the netizens. But when the names uh, 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 created by the netizens use, uh, uh, are derived from copyright work, then there will be a copyright issue. Because in this case, Dongyang, uh, uh, Le was is Dou uh, uh, So the defendant is actually a popular, uh, 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 the Dou Ban was sued by the plaintiff for corporate infringement for allowing its registered users to upload screenshots. So people uh, snapshots of the movies and they upload to Dou Ban, right? So uh, they think these photos and snapshots are owned by the copyright owner of the movie, so you are not to do that, allowed to do that. Then the court actually differentiate posters as still photos from screenshots. So in discussing um, the copyright issues related to screenshots or, or snapshots that you are taking from your own laptop when you, when you are viewing the movie, uh, the court indicated that because the number of uploaded frames was limited, and they were taken from 40 episodes. Together, they failed to reproduce the core idea of the original work, so, which is a way to interpret that uh, <coughs> when a cinematographical work was uploaded, and one of the screenshots uh, taken from it does not actually uh, tell the whole story of the whole movie, therefore it's not a substantial part of the movie. So therefore, it's not a print. It could not be considered as a substantial part did not substitute the original. Therefore, there was no infringement. So that was the uh, uh, judgment. So the problem of this, ju uh, this judgment is very clear because most of these fan creations and names are already part of the current internet social uh, ecosystem and stopping their distribution is actually impossible. Therefore, many UGC creators choose to ignore the risk of copyright liability, not only because the act of copying is actually subtle, and hence difficult for corporate owners to discover, but also the transaction cost is simply too high. The, too high for you to obtain a license because you're only sending a man. And too high for them to suit you because you know the damage will be very low. Right? So in the Doha case, what is most interesting is that the court has also ruled that upload action by users constitutes fair use by going beyond the 12 list exceptions of Article 22, and relying solely on Article 21 of the 2013 RICL, a two-step test. So the court actually held that because the rapid development of internet technology, the 12 exceptions could not satisfy current and future needs. So it was therefore logical to take the two-step step, two -two -step test entrenched in Article 21 of the RICL as a general cost and apply to new cases. So it's actually a creative interpretation by the court. So this solution, again, was brought up by the, uh, uh, the solution actually was brought up again by SBC. So it, a, trend, a 2011 opinion of the SBC provides that under some very special circumstances necessary for promoting technological innovation and business uh, Development, the use of words may be determined via use after consideration of the nature and purpose of the use, the nature of the word used, the quantity and quality of the part um, used, the impact of the use on potential markets or values, and artifact is providing as such use neither contravenes the normal use of the words nor results in unreasonable damage to the lawful interest of the author. So we actually, I think in here, uh, the court, the SPC, has proposed an alternative solution combining the US four factors and with a, a, a two-step test. So what I'm going to show you, show you next is that uh, uh, several uh, new ways of to explore words. 
spawned by new te technology developments in digital technology and commercial model have present a substantial challenges to the closed-based model of corporate of China and force Chinese courts to further deviate from their doctrinal uh, interpretation of the corporate law of China in their judgments by introducing a purely US concept, what we call the transformative use. For example, in the famous case, the Google Books case, Monsen versus uh, uh, Google, because we all know that what is a Google book, right? So then you search, then you have a book, you can, you can find on which page and contains what kind of uh, text is in there, and you can search on a book. So Google was sued by Monsen because Google put Watson's work on its website, uh, especially the Google Books project, uh, because they scanned several books authored by her without asking for permission. So in assessing the fair use claim of Google, both the Beijing First Intermediate People's Court and the Highest People's Court went beyond the closed list exceptions model of the common law of China and quote general principles of copyright or external concepts to support their findings. For example, the Beijing First Intermediary People's Court invoked the ultimate code of copyright to enforce its point. Um, and the courts uphold Google's fair use defense in infringement claims over the right of communication of information on networks for two reasons. First, Google only displays snippets of works which would not substantially serve as a substitute for the original work. Uh, in the market and therefore affects their market value. Second, if you are uh, displaying snippets of works, Google Books is providing users with a more advanced service of searching for information about works. This is, in fact, a transformative use. What, what they use, they are quoting this same, uh, uh, like, uh, 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 quoting this uh, term in, in its judgments. Um, in so doing, the court abruptly but creatively to do a purely American concept, which is transformative use to support its argument. However, the Beijing Higher People's Court, which is the second instance, did not move on the transformative part of the judgment of the first instance, although it did actually clarify that, based on curious uh, judicial premises, special circumstances outside the trial exceptions, less than Article 22 of the Copyright of China, may also constitute fair use. So the court further indicates that in assessing, in assessing whether these so-called special circumstances can be deemed as fair use, the courts should consider the following factors. So these factors actually echo with the, uh, uh, the four like, uh, factors of the fair use uh, as well. So uh, this is in fact a, um, um, something that they uh, uh, very creatively uh, uh, introduced some, some of these new concepts to solve their own problems. So then, um, the next is what we call the live game webcasting, also something that happens in here, which is the, the NetEase with the Spongebob Bardo. Actually, it, 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 um, this is some cases about uh, uh, Copyright owners uh, began to sue webcast service, provi web service providers uh, for copyright infringement because uh, some of, uh, uh, for example, in this case, Netflix is a very famous uh, Chinese internet giant, right? Uh, they run the famous online game Fantasy Westworld Journey 2 for more than 10 years. But then the problem is that after discovering the Guangzhou Huangdo company, the owner of a major webcasting company, um, uh, encouraging its contracted webcasters to, board, to, board, to, board, uh, to webcast and rebroadcast the playing of the set game back in 2012, uh, that gives to Bardo for cover infringement and a fair competition in 2014. So in October 2017, the Bonjo Intellectual Property Court denied the defendant's fair use claim and ruled that Bardo infringes, uh, that is, a copyright in the set game and awarded 20 million RMB in damages. So the problem is that um, the ruling is very clear, right? So because in general, the game screen can be protected as works created by uh, a process analogous to uh, cinematographic uh, works under Article 3 of the Copyright of China. So the court also stated that the involvement of human player 
As no creative efforts to get the work, as the developer has already defined the essential parts of the game, because the, so the, he thinks the player is merely uh, playing within the scene set by the game developer. So thus the player was merely following uh, predefined instructions. So by webcasting a protected work and showing the game screen to the subscribers, Bardo has infringed at least copyright over the board. So what I'm uh, focusing on is how he actually analyzed whether this constitutes fair use. The court is very negative in finding a fair use. He says that even if the game screen was utilized as a tool to demonstrate the player's skill, it is just a difference of perspective between player and viewers, and it, is, it will not surely obliterate the value of the game screen as the value was not transferred. And webcasting does not fit within any list of exceptions in Article 22 of the Copyright of China, and therefore it is not fair use. So this is a very really, uh, interesting uh, uh, analysis because it actually differs from uh, the previous uh, analysis as well. So my observation is in this part is that it's evident from the cases revealed that the notion of transformative use has been widely used by many courts in designing difficult cases. For instance, in the second instance of the previously mentioned the poster case, which concerns the uh, Himal Jinjiang and, 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 and Guru one, uh, the Shanghai Intellectual Property Court introduced the concept of transformative use as well. So they, they introduced a transformative use to interpret explaining a certain point, uh, part of the quotation exception in Article 22, subsection 2. So the court indicated that explaining a certain point requires concerns, uh, uh, the, the requirement actually concerns using other words to explain a different problem, not to purely show the authentic value of the coded work. So the effect value and function of the copyright cartoon figures quoted by the poster was therefore transformative and use, and therefore exhibit a new value, meaning and function. So in addition to complementing the interpretation of the list exceptions of Article 22 of the Copyright of China, actually the notion of transformative use has a role to play in providing shelter for those uh, are not listed uh, in the, the, the are not covered by the copyright exception list. So when challenged by new ways of utilizing works facilitated by new technologies, um, which is not uh, listed in the copyright exceptions, the approaches taken by the Chinese courts were always utilitarian. So they tend to integrate the copyright exceptions flexibly by providing additional justifications that favors the public. So. Uh, 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 for example, in both the Doba case and the Google uh, Books case, the court indicates that it is a common practice for them to go beyond Article 22 of the Copyright Law of China and apply a more flexible assessment model. However, their interpretations are different. You can see that uh, there are uh, inconsistencies between these courts. Some of them rely on the Article 21 and use it as a catch all clause. Uh, well, the latter, some of these courts suggest that consulting a list of five elements that stem directly from judicial practices, uh, in which some are deemed to overlap. So the Guangzhou IP court in, in, in the sort of the, the, the webcasting case uh, is actually a waiver between adopting an open-ended uh, fair use mechanism and confining fair use to these exceptions in Article 22 uh, in the judgment. Uh, the Guangzhou IP court asserts from the perspective of the trial interpretation that online game webcasting is not covered by any listed exceptions in Article 22, hence it should not be considered fair use. So uh, these kind of conflicting decisions reflect the struggle of the Chinese uh, judiciaries when interpreting the law creatively, as the current law is lagging behind substantially and provides legal guidance over those matters. Mm -hmm. So some of the courts think it's okay to jump out with Article 22. Um, some of the courts then say that, well, it's not okay to jump out the Article 22. So that's what I observe. So they have these inconsistencies in the prime law. So this summary shows that in the face of new challenges brought by technological developments, Chinese courts are willing to go beyond the inadequate post-based setting and introduce new concepts 
that to justify the act when necessary. Uh, however, the concept of transformative use is brought in the US four factor fair use, as we know, in the first factor, uh, which is supported by a merit case laws in the US. So when integrating transformative use in the United States, you have loads of case laws to say why this is transformative and what is the theory behind that. Uh, if the Chinese courts nearly introduce the concept without introducing the surrounding circumstances and supporting precedents, without this support, uh, this only interpretation is thus uh, inevitable. Uh, however, if a reference point exists, for example, like uh, the, the Google, Google's book case that in the US, or the Google Books case in China, so every time we have a difficult case, we go to the United States and they have a ruling. So it, it's easier for the Chinese court to, to uh, deliver a favorable verdict uh, for new technologies and commercial models to be beneficial to the society. Whereas in the webcasting case, because the United States, they don't have that kind of uh, case law. So there's no reference point. So the courts are sort of like uh, very hesitant to give permission to say, oh, webcasting is OK, because they don't know how to see whether we should go beyond the article 22 or not. So, so it is very clear that, court, that the current post-based setting of corporate exceptions in the corporate of China is inadequate in the face of new challenges, and it's incompatible with the best developing economy, and has triggered many corrective measures from the SBC, uh, such as the SBC judicial interpretations and greater interpretations by different courts. Uh, however, although both of these corrective measures uh, aim to restore balance to the corporate law of China. Uh, they have also caused discrepancies between courts and uh, are intrinsically flawed. Uh, one must admit it that the judicial interpretations issued by the SBC, uh, uh, discussed previously, uh, has played a very active and very important role in providing practical help for courts to solve some of these new corporate cases. But the law provides clearly that SPC could only integrate questions involving the specific application of laws and decrees in court trials. Accordingly, the interpretive documents issued by the Standing Committee are legislative interpretations, whereas the, those issued by SPC are what we call the judicial interpretations. In theory, the judicial application, uh, the power of judicial application, is uh, sort of like a, a uh, the judicial application is actually limited to clarifying and strengthening the laws without changing their original meaning. So this means that judicial interpretations cannot go beyond the original meanings of the interpreted law. So if you try to interpret Article 22, which is a corporate exception, you need to stick to the setting of Article 22. You cannot just so create something they don't exist. So let alone creating new laws. So this will contravene the power of the standing committee of the NPC. Uh, however, as observed by many scholars, the SPC has played a far more active role than expected. The SPC has quite often Hi, gone beyond. Laura. To <laughs> so often go go beyond is remitted by uh, issuing lawmaking judicial interpretations uh, regarding issues from different fields of the law which is deemed unconstitutional. So this is some works uh, done by my uh, colleagues that they found this kind of practices are uh, uh, not good. Um, this is echoed by the fact that the two copyright related SPC judicial interpretations uh, we have discussed previously uh, also go beyond merely integrating the law uh, by creating, uh, they, are, they go beyond the, the integrating existing law by creating new laws. So the legal status of these judicial interpretations uh, discussed previously is no doubt uncertain, as their nature uh, uh, is obvious uh, uh, ultra rights, and the standing committee of the NBC will have the final say over their validity. So considering that the 2015 revision of the legislation law of China has once again made clear that the role of SBC in interpreting the laws and the power of the standing community, uh, the standing committee to invalidate the SBC judicial limitation, it will be much wiser 
not to rely on this uh, judicial limitation to solve the problem of the coast lease exception model. And this will appear to be a good idea. So um, it is also noticeable from the pre uh, preceding discussions that levels of Chinese courts open than the SBC uh, has also taken a pragmatic uh, uh, approach to the challenges uh, uh, raised by new technologies. For, for instance, um, the two uh, the SBC judicial limitations were promulgated because the lower courts in many cases de uh, deviate from the doctrinal path in their judgments, but they intentionally, unintentionally generate the same problem. So for instance, in both the Doban case and the Google Books case, the court actually clearly indicated that it is common practice for courts to go beyond the listed exceptions provided by Article 22. However, in the Netflix case, the poster case, and the Google Books case, the purely US concept transformative use was introduced by the courts to add more flexibility uh, to the copyright exception regime of the copyright law of China. <coughs> These initiatives are voluntary and no doubt help Chinese courts to solve uh, some of these uh, very difficult, difficult cases. So despite this positive effect, the courts in these cases have gone beyond the scope of their, their legal authority by creating new laws even without doubtful permission from the SBC judicial limitations. So they don't, actually what I mean is that they don't have this authority, they don't have this power to do this. Uh, this is a sort of unsustainable practice that was criticized by many scholars, including Robin in this room, right? So uh, it leads to discrepancies between uh, courts regarding the interpretation of copyright exceptions as when it's uh, in the Netflix case and other cases such as Google Books case. Um, another sort of a dubious or suspicious practice is the so-called judicial legislation issued by local courts. For example, the Beijing Higher People's Court has tend to issue many of these judicial legislations um, right? So, which provides further details on the interpretation of the copyright law uh, provisions. So despite the positive social effects brought by these types of judicial documents, they are intrinsically frauded for the same reason in relation to the SBC judicial interpretation, by which it means that they are not allowed to do that. But nevertheless, in order to facilitate or to promote some of these uh, cases to be solved, they do this. So it is very clear that uh, from the previous discussion, unless, unless the challenges to the constitutional grounds can be overcome, uh, the SBC judicial interpretations and these uh, problematic practices followed by local courts uh, uh, as solutions to the problems of the copyright exceptions, one of the copyright of China, are not ideal for uh, a civil law of China because we are here to uh, doctrinal interpretation of our laws, and the courts cannot create uh, new laws unless there is a cons constitutional ground based on that. So furthermore, without a case law tradition, uh, any judgments that aim to create new laws will come to nothing until the rules create, are codified into the law. So it doesn't matter whether we have more cases in here and there, but because we don't have a case law system, uh, we need to have it on the law. So hence, the solution must come from the copyright law of China and a change towards a more flexible regime, uh, which is uh, desperately needed. So the question is, will the 2014 proposal solve the problem? I noticed that there are new proposals, but not released to the public. So I can only base on 2014, even though I got this new version that has uh, turned around a little bit, so it changed back to the original setting. But uh, the 2014 uh, proposal is something that needs to be discussed. Uh, the draft is very clear. It adds sort of like an open-ended provision. So if you have uh, uh, read the draft, you will notice that it actually inserts other circumstances as a catch-all exception, as a 13th, as the 13th exception. Then it actually provides uh, 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 the second uh, sentences which is a two-step test in Article 43 um, to cover all of these listed exceptions. So by which it means that if you have something that could fall down on other circumstances, then you could use the two-step test 
to do it like a catch-all way of doing things. So, but the problem is that if the law is interpreted in a systematic manner, then there is a clear indication under this kind of setting that certain new types of uses, for example, uh, parity, digital parity, are potentially covered by a specific type of exception. For example, quotation. Um, that's, that's why you see in Hong Kong and in, in the United Kingdom, when in 2014 they introduced the parity exception, they are putting it down on the quotation exceptions, like uh, an, an adding on exceptions of the quotation. So because they think quotation and parody are something linked together, it's just a different ways of uh, quoting and commenting on the issue. So it's a very special quotation. So, but if under this setting, if something is already covered by quotation, then you will probably not to be covered by paragraph 13 regarding other circumstances. Because in a doctrinal way, if something is already been covered by this, then you should not go down there. So as a result, the court has to preclude application of all the trial basic circumstances before relying on paragraph 13 to assess fair use cases. So this other circumstances exception is also very too broad. It's too broad to be deemed as a certain special case which is required by first step of the third three step test. So these issues are actually uh, raised by many scholars as well. Uh, furthermore, the proposed uh, flexible setting uh, involving the introduction of a two-step test uh, is uh, inferior to a U.S. four factor uh, fair use model in the following ways. First, the burden three step test is not suitable for direct transplant, right? Uh, because it, it was designed to further, to guide further implementation by the signatories rather than to be applied directly. So it's not something that you should aim to transplant directly. Um, the second is that the Chinese courts are more familiar with the US POUs test, as you can see in the previous cases that every time they find difficult in interpreting something, they go to the US case, and the US case is based on the US four-factor case, uh, the test. So therefore, they're very familiar in how to apply these four factors uh, in a way that is uh, suitable to solve the current issues. Um, um, the third is that the US model is more flexible in accommodating new challenges, because if you uh, check you know, the background of the three-step test, uh, the three-step test will apply on a cumulative basis, by which it means that when you satisfy the first step, then you go to the second. You satisfy the second, then you go to the third. Whereas in the in US four-factor scale, there's no kind of like that kind of setting. So it can be very flexible if you satisfy the first factor, even though some, several factors are failed, it can be also passed. It depends on how, how the core will interpret. So it will be more flexible. Uh, 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 in a way compared with uh, the three-step test. So, based on the uh, present discussions, it seems that logical that the Chinese legislators should propose an Article 43.1 uh, with a U.S. four-factor setting rather than a three-step test model. Unfortunately, there, uh, this was not included in the draft and may not be included in the future for the following reasons. Because as Peter Yu uh, indicated that um, the U.S. Uh, uh, fair use doctrine, as we can see that, they have some problems as well. And Peter, you indicated that if you do transplant, you could bring in a recipient country's problems from the source countries, right? So you introduce something, you, you not just introduce the good parts, but you also introduce uh, some of these problems they link to. For example, Elastic has mentioned that it's very costly and it delivers too slowly. Um, uh, and what the reviewers often has little connection with the justice underlying the claim. And BB has also claimed that courts tend to apply the factors mechanically and they sometimes make opportunistic uh, uses of the contract in the precedent available to them. So some of the courts say yes, some of them say, say no. So if the court thinks that I should go this way, they, they would just pick some of the cases that favors uh, this uh, 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 finding. So, uh, and also, uh, the very notion of transformative use that has been quite substantially quoted by Chinese courts uh, uh, 
was an ambiguous concept introduced by uh, Judge Neville uh, into the USB and US test in 1990 and is deemed controversial in the United States as well. So I think that the problem is that there is no reason for China science leaders to bear the risk of transplanting a not so perfect US copyright law of China uh, doctrine into Chinese copyright law because the top priority for China is to establish an open model rather than a US model of copyright exceptions. The problem is that we, we need it open, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a US model. So and they can always design a flexible but unique exceptions model around the US peer use doctrine, which that we have already seen in the proposal, even though there's a lot of discussions about introducing the US four factors, but then eventually we come up with a very unique design. So that's that's what, what we observed. So but it's also very important to note that the continental European civil law tradition of the cover of China is not a critical reason that prevents China from introducing the US law back to the US test directly because uh, many East Asian jurisdictions, such as South Korea and Taiwan, have managed to introduce the fair use as well. Because as you may know, Taiwan has introduced it since uh, 1992. Um, but um, Korea has uh, introduced it in 2016 already. So of all the jurisdictions that have changed their closed this model to an open one, what Peter Rhee has observed that is that most of them choose to avoid a marked change to the current setting by retaining a considerable part of the status quo, including pre-existing fair dealing provisions. So fair dealing provisions basically means exceptions. So the causes underlying this consensus choice to retain a considerable part of the system quo range from economic to social and from legal to technological. Um, so especially for legislators in China, as we know, they are very vulnerable to many of these criticisms and uh, fears, right? So uh, when they face this repeated pressure from the United States, in relation to IP issues and has no historical connection with sort of the old British uh, fear dealing paradigm or anything connected to the United States, they will be more inclined to build from their current setting and establish a customized regime based on local convictions. And as we, as Peter Lee has, has proposed that, um, China can actually uh, uh, make add as a norm maker if uh, its economic and technological developments uh, ask for an indigenous uh, approach, one that builds upon their historical traditions and cultural backgrounds and that takes account of their drastically different social economic conditions, even more so with the choice of cover exception models. So we don't have to follow the United States. We can build our own. For example, like in the webcasting case, it's very clearly to see that China has go in other bounds or far beyond the uh, United States in some of these aspects that we'll be able to define our own laws that we don't necessarily have to follow a uh, pre-existing path which uh, are you know, defined by the United States. So what will the future path be? Uh, currently, there's no de de definitive answer. Uh, nevertheless, one thing is clear, the corporate law of China in the corporate exceptions design that is flexible enough to keep pace with any uh, technological changes in the future. So from a theoretical point of view, uh, China should adhere to and refine the proposed flexible model, thereby developing its own presence. Uh, in terms of structure, the setting should be flexible enough to leave ample room for Chinese force to elaborate, uh, but in the same time, it should not be so flexible that it allows force to introduce troubles that various models are currently facing and risks that China can support. Uh, in short, the new setting must sacrifice some flexibility for certainty. Um, experiences from like East, East Asian uh, jurisdictions can actually be um, uh, 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 could be used as a reference point uh, while deciding a future path towards uh, uh, amendment. So, for example, like uh, Taiwan has actually taking a step back in 2014 revision of this corporate law. So the corporate exemptions model has been changed from general fair use 
clause that covers all the least exceptions to the semi fair dealing model in which the exceptions and limitations should be applied independently of the four factor test for fee use unless the wording of the provisions includes a reasonable scope. So, um, what, what they do is that it provides a list of exceptions and they do uh, provide a fair use for factors which resembles our proposal, but they differentiate whether these uh, fair use for factors can cover uh, some of these uh, exceptions or not. So they put uh, uh, keywords like a uh, reasonable scope in some of these exceptions and when those exceptions can uh, 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 attach with the keywords a uh, reasonable scope, then this exception can be analyzed by the various four factors. And some of these exceptions are very confined and very solid and can only interpret from a in his historical way according to their own precedents. So in Japan, in May 2018, Japan actually amended its copyright law and changed the structure of its closed list copyright exceptions to a semi open model. Um, um, it, it first uh, uh, compartmentalized the copyright exceptions into three types, so according to the purpose they served and market considerations. For example, they, they have a harmless use, uh, which refers to use that do not fall under the original purposes of the use of the copyright. Law. It's not only harming the interest of the rights holder. I think it's more similar to the transformative use. Um, minor harm use, which refers to use that do not fall under the original purpose of the use of the copyright work, but will cause a minor degree of damage to the right holder. Um, this is something like a less transformative use. So pol uh, public policy uses, which is referred to use this fall under the original purpose of the use of copyright work, but are permitted in order to realize Public policy objectives such as cultural development. So this is something like a mandatory like a license or mandatory exception. So for public uh, uh, considerations. So they actually reconstructed its exceptions into a multi-layered uh, style, which includes a general clause, and there's a list, and there's a catch-all clause. So you can see from this um, that. These are the amendment, one of the examples of Article 30.4. So it especially provides, first there's a, there's a purpose of the exception, is the exploitation is not for enjoying the ideas or emotions expressed in the work. So anything that you download for work, not for the purpose of enjoying the work, for example, a book, you, you, you do the book, you use the book or copy the book, not for the purpose of enjoying the book, but to do something else, then will be covered by this exception. So there's a kind of a list. And there's a general list, a general clause says that it is permissible uh, in any of the following cases, um, provided, however, that this does not apply if the exploitation would unreasonably prejudice the interests of the cover owner, and so something like that. So it's more like um, a, a three-step test or, or a fair use like a general clause around this, uh, this exception. And they, then they provide two exceptions. First is uh, like uh, experiments for the development of credit organization of technologies concerning the recording of sounds and visuals or other exploitation such work, which is an old exception already provided by Chinese copyright law. And they have this new one, what we call information analysis. This is something linked to data mining and AI analysis. So by which it means that if you use the work for this purpose, then it should be allowed. And also, in order to be more flexible, they're providing a catch all clause under these two under these two exceptions, saying that in addition to the place, cases or in, the, in addition to the examples provided above, if anything that can fit in the scenario that. Uh, does not involve receiving the exception, uh, expressions in such a word through the human sense, then it should be covered by this as well. So what the design is actually uh, move further e elaborates a certain exception. For example, we have trial exceptions. What we can do is actually uh, to focusing on a new exception or an existing exception to try to elaborate it more and put it up a little bit and give you more space and to cover more things under it. For example, we all know that the Marrakesh Treaty is saying that something should be done for the blind, uh, 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 the visually impaired. 
So one of the proposals may be to, to reconstructure our pre-existing uh, exceptions related to visually impaired people and to make it more broader so that you know not just blind people uh, can be benefit from it, but some of this like a, like a physically impaired people can also be uh, uh, covered by that exception. So that will be sort of a way. So what can we learn from these Taiwan and Japan uh, experiences is very simple. Is that instead of uh, transplanting an exotic model for Bayesian, uh, China should uh, 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 tinker its current model according to its needs by opening up the setting to provide more flexibility and at the same time maintain a degree of certainty. So uh, the pitfalls that China should try to avoid is that it must not try to create a necessary path dependence within China's courts and an incoherence of laws. For example, if you follow too much about US via US test, then the problem is that you will be bound by this US way of thinking that you can never get away with it and, and to form your own like a way of jurisprudence. Second, you must not try to be too conservative as China has different local needs and may face fewer institutional constraints than Taiwan and Japan. Just consider that our guiding case uh, system, which can be very useful in the way to providing guidance and, and, and how to uh, integrate law. So the future is that uh, I think to refine the current setting, uh, so we should base on the priorities of the country and to nominate new exceptions and then consolidate uh, cognate ones under a border theme, provide them with a general cross list and catch-all setting. Um, for example, like the one I mentioned about America's treaty, that is, will, will be a good way to, to start. No genetic general cross is definitely required as well because unlike other uh, their counterparts in Japan and Taiwan, uh, I think Chinese judges have to play a more active role uh, in, in, in uh, uh, concretizing uh, legal rules of general nature and in, uh, uh, substantiating such rules with more detailed and precise specifications in the process of adjudicating individual cases and making legal rules compatible with social development. Um, so I think the Chinese legislators should refrain from directly using either the burden three-step test or the fair use test as a style of the general cause. As you can see in, in Japan's case, they are they just trying to merge all of these things into their own style. So China has already passed a docking terms for the international treaties hastily in order to prove international compliance uh, era because we are already in a much more advanced stage and therefore is more confident in adopting foreign concepts to local needs. So no country can monopolize concepts from copyright jurisprudence such as uh, quantity, quality, and market substitution, these kind of things. So Chinese legislators should intermingle this concept with the design of copyright sections, thereby institutionalizing them so that the courts can refrain from citing exotic concepts that are directly linked to foreign corporate exception models and are not found in the Chinese legal system. So I think that's all. Thank you very much.
we, we should uh, take a different approach rather than that simply borrowed uh, gas plant. Yes. Uh, thank you. So I, uh, I, I, I fully agree with you that the, the concept or some of these um, um, ideas that develop from the field news doctrine is very useful. And, and it basically covers uh, each and every corner of, of, of all the things that we should analyze. But like I said in the last line, so no country can monopolize concepts from corporate jurisprudence. But it's just that uh, we need to identify the certain elements or the concept they use in the, in the four factors. And to, like from Japan's experience, I think it's ch just trying to to, to, to build your own uh, way of how to make use of these elements yeah. and how to structuralize it into your own language. So in order to build, not to build like a you know, path by uh, dependence. If you build path, de path dependence, the problem is that the Chinese courts will then always have to follow the United States because they, they're much more advanced in, in, in explaining what is the four factors and how you, you should use great. And they will dominate the whole idea in how to structuralize their whole structure. The problem is that if we, we just borrow the concepts, and we try to build it with our own structure, mm -hmm. then we can start to build our own like uh, jurisprudence over it with the same rationale. But the problem is that uh, then we will sort of like uh, become a norm uh, setting uh, country in, in, in the field and to influence <laughs> other countries because uh, what Peter has observed is that many of these countries, they, they just don't take in the, the field use. They change it. Uh, for example, uh, like, uh, uh, like in, even in Taiwan, it's, it's not like a pure like a field use uh, uh, analysis. Uh, for example, in, in, in Japan, initially they proposed, what I heard from them is that they in, initially they proposed to, in, to introduce the field use uh, verbatim. So uh, they're taking all the failures and replace their own proper exceptions. But in the end, after the discussion and when the law comes out, it becomes a very kind of a conservative way of doing things. What they do is that they actually uh, taking all of these considerations and to build their own set. So I think that this is kind of a current practice, in, uh, especially in this area, East Asian countries. Many of these countries, they're trying to improve their proper exceptions, but uh, if they have a very I think for Korean, is that Korea is kind of a difficult case because I don't think there's too much things happening in Korea. So they they, they just introduced the four factors, but I, for many of the cases, as I, what I heard from people from Korea, they said, we don't have too much these problems as China has. So what I'm saying is that China could have the possibility to take the lead in building sort of like a norm building and to influence other countries. Okay. I guess I still have a, a problem in understanding your point. Uh, as I know, the, 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 also know, the U.S. Uh, fair use test is, I think that the, the four factors are pretty general. The first yeah. one, the purpose of the use and the, the nature of the, the second one, the nature of the work, the third one, the sustainability of the use, mm -hmm. the last one about whether you have negative impact on current on the market of the world. Uh, I think this kind of item is actually very general, and uh, I think every country could uh, apply yeah. this kind of test to achieve their own policy goals if they do have some different goals. So it uh, provides so much flexibility for every course. So we don't need to worry about uh, the US uh, judicial decisions or position on particular uh, cases will definitely dictate on the mm -hmm. other countries' choice, right? If you say, even on the same test, on the same cases, it's still possible for you to come up with different solutions. So if we think it's not a problem, why just use this kind of very generalized to develop in your own Series, right? <laughs> so I think look, I think that the, the points I, 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 I don't share with you is that uh, maybe you trust the judges too much. I, I don't <laughs> trust the judges. So the problem is that I think they, from these case laws that I described, I think they are most of them are just copying from outside. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is that they are not as advanced as you. Like uh, we, we know these things and we know how to get rid of the problems. 
But some of them, they are just eager to, to find a solution. So if there's a US case, most of the time what I observe, especially in these new challenges, um, they will just borrow the rationales behind it and then just see if it fits. And some of these case, case laws, especially in the Google, Google Books case, there are some problems in terms of interpretation as well. So in the, uh, for example, in, in the first instance, they think that you know, uh, the, the infringements on, uh, the defense for the infringements on uh, the, the, uh, like, um, information, like that uh, kind of uh, uh, distribution on the uh, dissemination on the information network, it's, it's okay. But that is not okay for, for copying. Copy. So that, that kind of rationale is, it means that the judges are not so well uh, uh, fitted. I think for, for the current time, uh, if we give too much freedom, like this uh, US way of thinking, they don't know how to go. Right, the problem. What I'm, what I'm saying is that I don't trust the judges in a way that they they will not, they will be very confused to see how to go. So most of the time, I think they will look for precedents in the United States and somewhere else that applies the same uh, structure and to see how they deal with it and they just borrow it. The problem is that uh, it will be too flexible. So what I'm thinking, what I'm proposing is something that is less uh, flexible, but is. But you still, you still keep yeah. the general part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You still keep you the general make part. The, the, the yeah. So what I'm saying is that we should keep the list because the list can, can contain, I think, 90% of the cases. Yeah, we will yeah. agree. Yeah. 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 We should keep the other list. Yeah. And we still we should, should, even under the fair dealing yeah. order, you will also the open yeah. list approach. We still keep some part yeah. of the court to, yeah. to, to apply to some new cases, create some new exceptions. Yeah. So that's well, you think that part should be also the yeah, yeah, fair use yeah. for factors. So I would suggest more <laughs> factors, right? Like uh, maybe we should work on more to see whether there are some more factors or a different way of uh, saying it. Uh, but the two-step test will be too linked to the burn interpretation because if you follow that rationale, then people will go back to the yeah. burn convention to see what's the meaning behind it. And it will put out a lot of uh, limitations on the interpretation. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. The yeah. Yeah. conventions uh, are not uh, yeah. supposed to be applied directly yeah. to different cases. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, my another uh, question is, you know, China already allowed the court to uh, attribute a lot of new cases and create new exceptions. Mm -hmm. And so far, I think the uh, the whole the, the general public uh, is satisfied with the, yeah. the court uh, decisions on this kind of new exceptions, right? So it, it does not pose a really threat to the legal certainty or the predictability of why we think in the future to this kind of general, the application of general legal will cause a serious problem. You will look at the, the history, right? We already resolved all these kind of new challenges or problems. Um, so far, that's a good way. Yeah. So, why uh, we need to worry about The one, <laughs> one kind of uh, realistic point is that what I'm saying is that uh, we don't have a good relationship <laughs> with the United States at the moment. So, if you prepare something fully US, I, I suspect that will encounter some problems. I suspect. <laughs> so uh, I'm just proposing if we want to uh, actually observe or, or, or to, uh, to take the good parts of the US experience, we need to try to adapt it to our own like, language mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, either it can pass or it will not uh, imply some sort of these bad uh, images or saying that well, we are still following the United States, we are like taking everything they have in here. So uh, if they force us to change the law, we just follow the United States. So this kind of a bad image that will, will result. Uh, uh, that's one thinking from a more realistic way of doing things. Uh, that happens in Japan as well, because initially they proposed to follow um, the US model, and some criticism actually focusing on whether we should so follow the United States, because we are an independent country. Why we just follow their company? Their, their whole like uh, fair use uh, uh, setting into our law. We are like a civil law jurisdiction. We should we should have some civil law way of thinking. So that's what what, what they proposed. 
And also thinking one of the reasons that they do not follow the four, four, four factors is that they, the judges opposed to this proposal strongly. Mm -hmm. The judges thinking that we are not going to create any laws. We can only integrate laws. Uh, so because the US four factors rely heavily on, on precedents and case laws. So I, they don't think that is kind of a suitable uh, mechanism for a civil law jurisdiction like Japan. So they propose something uh, solid uh, that for them to operate. I don't know, but the, the Japanese uh, professors are very interesting. They're saying, they, they think that judges are more inclined or more trained to interpret law and following like a German style, like uh, if you have a law, then how to interpret it and the fitting, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But I think this kind of civil law theory. <laughs> I know that's not make too much sense. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we are going over some of the some of some of the the general the general principle of civil law or other kinds of civil law code. Actually, we a lot of the court to apply quite a few general principles, mm -hmm. like the principle of good faith, principle of uh, fairness, <laughs> even like that, to adjudicate a specific case. So in that kind of scenario, we don't worry. We don't say the court is a uh, great new precedent, right? Yeah. But if you allow the court about that kind of general principle, why well, I think the fair use doctrine is much more specific, right? So judicial power in creating this kind of new especially even the, under the Chinese law, even when the court created an exception, we don't believe that this conversation has any presidential value, right? Yeah. The only kind of persuasive authority for future judges. So, uh, in theory, run not this decision run not from any uh, future courts, right? So it's not a kind of uh, judicial manual. Right? Yeah. So I I fully really understand. I think that that's why I'm saying China is different from Japan and Korea. We can be more flexible because they are sort of bound by this uh, conception that is uh, very old style. The Japanese think that you know, uh, if this court integrate in this way and that court integrate in that way, they will cause problems. They think that because they're a small country, they want everybody to integrate law more or less in the same or similar way. So better if they have a very detailed exceptions than they know how to apply it. Uh, at least to be uh, much more uh, uh, focused on a certain uh, use. Uh, so that's why they propose something like uh, like machine reading or something. So that something they didn't know how to go. Mm -hmm. But like fair use uh, four factors can kind of be too bored for them. They think that everything can be discussed under here. Then if if he thinks differently than me, because the factors are like 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 Barton Bibi has mentioned that you know when you integrate these things actually uh, you might be a, a, a opportunistic a way mm -hmm. of uh, applying which case law to, to make use of it. So uh, Especially in a civil law jurisdiction, then the problem is that you will have this uh, in, inconsistent interpretations of this fair use among several cases because we don't have case law system. So that's that's really the problem. If you don't make law, the problem is that the other will not follow you. So then you have a case, you have a judge in here saying this will be fine, and then the judge in there saying that that will, that will not be working. So like I see in here. So the problem is that uh, we need to more. Uh, we need to add some flexibility to the system, but uh, one of the proposing is that um, the catch-all clause should be only uh, to the, the last resort, right? So we can, um, if we identify something that we should protect, we should put them into like a very specific exception, mm -hmm. like the Marrakesh, like for the physically impaired people exception, something like that, develop a little bit, give more guidance to the court. And if we see that data mining and AI analysis should be, should be covered, then we have exception in there. So if we don't, uh, something that we cannot identify at the moment, then we'll add it to, yeah. uh, to the last part. So that will add more certainty to the whole list instead of having like a very general fair use clause, uh, which is, I think somehow it will contravene with our civil law way of doing things. Yeah, I agree. Even in China, yeah. one of those Advocate for a fair use approach. We do not house the legislature to gradually codify the new examples step by step. So I think probably that's the future. Yes. Yeah. Okay.
Yeah, it's it's my great honor to meet you here. Yeah, um, my question is: um, um, recently, I'm studying the fair use system to apply to the uh, short video cases, and I found a new case happened in U.S. last year. And basically, on February last year, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit ruled in the TVI case that the TV view, viewing function provided by the defendant didn't constitute for the fair use. So, and which have uh, Professor Tsui has been mentioned in, in this court to have uh, uh, illustrated one of the key criteria in fair use rules, uh, namely whether the alleged use creates, creates a licensing market. So, uh, actually, uh, as we all know, the court is also the court for the uh, famous case, uh, Google Library. And the defendant want to use a Google case to defense, but the court denied. So, my question is, uh, uh, I think the court criteria is one of the elements for the uh, influence on the potential market value of the original work in the four factors. So actually, it seems that there's no any uniform rules for um, a court to apply for those cases. And my question is how to identify the force, the force factor, considering all the elements which have shown ever? Uh, yeah. Okay. So you are saying you are not so sure about the four factors? Uh, y y yes, I mean, um, there are, uh, with the development of the technology, and we could find more elements for the force factor, especially for the force factor. Uh, so, actually, I don't know how to identify which one is uh, constituted the force factors, uh, the force factor, yeah. You mean whether I have a negative impact on the so-called potential yeah. market? Yeah. Oh. So maybe the court will find all the uh, uh, things happening in the society to uh, to illustrate to illustrate it as the force factors. Yeah. So um, this, I think, will be a sort of like a policy consideration in many of these uh, U.S. case laws. Uh, it's just to see whether uh, I think the court has to first thing to decide whether. It, uh, you should give the, that part of the market to mm -hmm. the copyright owner. Yeah. So, uh, I, uh, especially, I think if, if the same case about the webcaster uh, case happens in the United States, they will, they will also have to discuss these issues to see whether uh, you, by developing a game, uh, whether you should enjoy the subsequent market of uh, webcasters. So okay. I think it's more like a market consideration to see whether uh, some of these uh, judgments we should favor this part and the other part we should favor it or not. For example, like the, uh, I think it's a, um, what is the case name again? It's about uh, like a, a Cario or something. So yeah, in Cario, it's about the photographs, like uh, transformative videos, right? So initially, I think they, they, they also put a lot of weight on four factors because uh, taking photos and make it an art are two kind of related market, but uh, whether that should be given to, to the copyright owner of the photo, that would be a different issue, right? So because then the court is actually finding saying that because this is a high market, so this is totally a different market than a photograph's market, because once it has turned into a high art, it can sell a very high price, whereas as a photo, we can only include in a, in a photograph book collection, uh, then it can only sell a very small uh, marginal price. So then, therefore, it actually considers that uh, these two markets are not the same, therefore it is not this uh, potential market, things like that. So yeah. I don't know whether the story has something to add on that. Yeah, uh, I would say that to determine yeah. whether there is a potential market for rising the copyright work is a policy decision. Um, but usually, you know, I think that's the, what we're going to need. Uh, the most uh, important series talk about mm -hmm. uh, market failure. Even with the lift, uh, create this kind of um, license market in itself could work. And uh, the, the potential licensee could bear the cost to mm -hmm. seeking for this kind of license. I think probably 
we should treat uh, this kind of potential uh, market as uh, that as one should be protected for that profile. Only. So the key issue is whether this kind of potential market itself could work. Right? For example, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the, as a case in the maintenance case, first of all, I mean, even you treat this kind of uh, maintenance picture, small picture as a profile work, I think it's uh, unlikely <laughs> <laughs> the laws will require all the users to get a license you know, once, yeah. right? So I think the, 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 the transaction cost probably is too high. So in this kind of uh, situation, probably in this kind of, even if you do that kind of co by work, you should not do that kind of yeah. uh, regular market or potential market. I think the best one is to treat this kind of picture, not the too simple, not the uh, co by or something like that. It's better. <laughs> it's my. So we, we could take another question and then we stop over an English version and the switch to Yes, <laughs> I think mean, it's easier to us. Do you have any question? Okay, no, well, we stop here and uh, now it's uh, pretty joining us to thank uh, Professor Potenta uh, for the wonderful presentation. And I hope in the future, this kind of presenting mark the beginning of our cooperation. Uh, in the future, we start frequently. Okay, thank you.